Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this wonderful kickoff event featuring some of the great Canadian leaders of distinction, commanders and transformers of 2010. My name is Angela Mondu, and I've had the privilege of co-organizing this event tonight, and I'm thrilled that so many of you are here to share the same passion for Canadian current events in business, political, and national defense. I'd like to recognize a couple of our notable guests who've joined us here tonight. We have Dr. Jorge Heine, a distinguished fellow at CG and former ambassador of Chile and deputy minister of the Chilean government. We also have Councillor Barry Verbanovich, I saw him earlier, he should be sitting up front here somewhere, and Waterloo Councillor Yan Dai for being here as well. Thank you very much. The driving force behind this evening's event really comes down to one word, and that word is passion. Passion for those who serve our country, who lead and execute our defense strategies, passion for our men and women who have and continue to wear the uniform. My career started in the late 80s, and I had the privilege to serve as a military officer for almost a decade. I wore the uniform with great pride. And I know that many of you in the audience will understand that once you've worn a uniform, it actually never comes off. I retired after nine years as a young officer and ventured into the exciting world of high tech and BlackBerry and a local success, success story called Research in Motion. It was here that I experienced a whole different kind of passion, the passion behind a small, at that time, entrepreneurial company, the conviction of driving competition and creativity to maintain that number one position in the marketplace. Somehow, fate has always always played a part in my career, and it led me to the perfect role for a high-tech marketing executive and ex-military officer, position as a director with the Canadian Forces Liaison Council, and our partner for this evening, and you'll meet a number of people from that organization. The CFLC mandate is to provide education and awareness to Canadian business leaders and the public with respect to the role of our Canadian Forces Reserve Force. What a perfect fit. My role is to connect the business world with the military. I get to do marketing while flying in the back of tactical helicopters. It doesn't get any better. The CFLC has also allowed me to connect many of you this evening through an experience we call the Executrek, the chance to spend a day in the life with our soldiers and reservists in training before they head off on a mission. Some of you have flown in tactical helicopters. Some of you have sat in F-18 fighter jets in Cold Lake, Alberta, or even spent a few days in Nunavut on an international exercise. I know at least one of you in the room this evening had an extra special opportunity to hang upside down a 50-foot rappel tower while an infantry sergeant worked hard to get you right side up. But as the saying goes, what happens on an executrek stays on an executrek. Well, two years ago, while sailing on a naval frigate from New York City to Halifax, told you the CFLC was a good gig for me, I was discussing with Rear Admiral Madison the latest naval challenge off the east coast of Africa and Canada's role in supporting NATO and the UN in dealing with pirates off the coast of Somalia. What struck me most was the discussion with the Admiral on business, economics, the impact on global security and so sovereignty. It was during this discussion that I realized, wouldn't it be great to bring this type of conversation to Canadians across the country? The Commander and Transformers concept was born during that discussion. My vision was to provide that kind of discussion to, and bring it to a whole new level, to bring together Canadians from all walks of life, business leaders, academics, politicians, students, the entire public, and let you experience the influencers and decision makers, our commanders and transformers, who shape our country firsthand. This evening's wonderful event would not have been possible without the Canadian International Council of Waterloo, led by President Joan Eiler, sitting in the front row here. Thank you so much, Joan. And supported by Joan's CIC volunteer team, Allison Yankee and Jeff Burt. The CIC was established to strengthen Canada's foreign policy, and the CFIC was an absolutely perfect partner to launch our Commanders and Transformers event this evening. Also, the Center for International Governance and Innovation, this spectacular venue that you're sitting in this evening, and Colleen Fitzpatrick and her team who've generously donated this venue for this wonderful function and backdrop for this evening. 
One last organization I wanted to highlight before we move on is Canada Company, represented here this evening by Bob Thompson. Launched in 2006, Canada Company has an incredible mandate to support the men, women, brothers, sisters, fathers, and mothers who belong to the Canadian Forces. Before the night's over, I encourage you to chat with Bob about Canada Company's incredible scholarship initiative for the kids of fallen soldiers, and please consider supporting this great cause this evening. I'm thrilled that all of you are here this evening to join us for this special kickoff event that we eventually would like to showcase in other major Canadian cities. I'm extremely proud that this event happened in Waterloo first, and we'd like to engage you in this evening's discussion. You'll see question cards on your seat, and we'd like you to fill them out. If you can fill them out and pass them to the volunteers throughout the discussion this evening, um, we will be then handing out or deal, um, providing the questions to our speakers as well once they've provided us with their, their initial discussion. I'm now going to pass the podium over to Captain Navy, Jamie Cotter. He's the Executive Director of the Canadian Forces Liaison Council, and I'd like him to introduce for us this evening our commanders and transformers. Thank you again for coming, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Jamie. Councillors, General Collin, Captain Bertrand, Dr. Lackenbauer, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. May I begin with a thank you to ICE, Angela Mondu, and CIC, Joan Eiler, for taking on the challenge and working so many long hours to produce this evening. As Angela indicated, I am the Executive Director for the Canadian Forces Liaison Council. What is the Canadian Forces Liaison Council, you may ask? It is a network of volunteers across Canada, divided into 10 provincial councils, one council for the north. Each provincial chair sits on the national council chaired by Mr. John Eaton. Your provincial council is chaired by none other than Mrs. Sonia Bata. These volunteers work tirelessly on behalf of the reserves to encourage businesses and educators to support reservists and reserve service. The council has been in existence for some 30 years. Through their efforts, many organizations have signed statements of support, but these days the trend is towards the development of a tailor-made military leave policy. Such a military leave policy is geared to the organization's needs and those of their reservists. This covenant goes beyond the provincial legislation, but is meaningful and specific to that organization's needs. The Council is supported in its efforts by a full-time secretariat in Ottawa and a network of part-time senior reservists dispersed across Canada, some of whom are here with us tonight. Together, we raise awareness of, by promoting the value inherent in military service, leadership, people management, teamwork, cooperation, just to name a few skills we pick up in our part-time military careers. Our activities are designed to educate and inform the organizational leaders. We do this by taking executives out to sea to see a reservist in action, be it in the field, at sea, in the air, or in our schools. We have 22 schools. Such training facilities, and we also make presentations or support speaking engagements such, such as this one. However, enough about CFLC. Please let me introduce our speakers this evening. I would ask the three speakers, General Collin, Captain Bertrand, and Dr. Lackenbauer to come to the stage as I go through their bios. General Collin, currently the Chief of Staff for Canada Command, Canadian Forces Command responsible for the defense of Canada and military aid to provincial governments and territories, is an armor officer by training. He has served in Europe, specifically in Bosnia and Germany. He has experience at the strategic headquarters and was responsible for the command of Joint Task Force Central, otherwise known as the Army of Ontario, where he was responsible for army readiness and the conduct of all military domestic operations within Ontario. This summer, he was the military lead during the recent G8 and G20 events. Captain Bertrand, currently the Director of Strategic Communications on the Maritime Staff in Ottawa, 
Throughout his seagoing career, he has been involved in military, option, military operations, as well as humanitarian assistance missions, where he deployed his ship, Annapolis, to Haiti in 1994. He has worked in a variety of headquarters functions, including serving as our naval attache in Washington. My good friend, Dr. Whitney Lackenbauer, who will play a special role as the host for this evening's speeches. Whitney is an assistant professor of modern Canadian history at St. Jerome's University. He holds a PhD and an MA in history from the University of Calgary and a BA from the University of Waterloo. His current research institutes include Arctic sovereignty and security, Aboriginal peoples and warfare, and the environmental impacts of military activities. He has held research positions at many institutions, including the Arctic Institute of North American Calgary, the Wilfrid Laurier Centre for Military and Strategic Disarmament Studies in Waterloo, and the Canadian Forces Leadership Institute in Kingston. One of Dr. Lackenbauer's most recent publications is Arctic Front, Defending Canada in the Far North. He is well-informed well informed, and passionate about his subject, the North. He is most suited to his challenge this evening. Dr. Lackenbauer? Great, thanks for the kind opening remarks, Captain Cotter, uh, who had the distinction, I don't know, the interesting experience of having worked on a, a Master of Defense Studies uh, paper, fantastic one at Canadian Forces College through their Joint Command and Staff Program, which was later published in the Journal of Military and Strategic Studies and has been very influential in my own thinking and the thinking of others um, over the last few years. I thought I'd start things off by sort of taking us up get a sense of, of just almost prepping the ground of what we're going to be working through tonight in terms of issues. And I've had a chance to, to prep the ground over the last eight years quite a bit, particularly really from the tundra up, going out on operations with the Canadian Rangers from coast to coast to coast, and really getting a sense of the diversity of the North and also the, the really foundational issues that we're grappling with these days. As Canadians, of course, we're usually content to be huddled along the, the parallel with the United States. I always say we're like the Chile of the North, right? You turn Chile on its axis and it's kind of like our country huddled along. Yet we very much get whipped into this fervor as soon as there's any concern that the Arctic is somehow going to be taken away from us. Right? The population of the city of Kitchener or Waterloo dwarfs that of the territorial norths. Yet somehow this is core to our identity and our sense of purpose. So in essence, we need to turn our minds on, its, on, on their axes and think of Canada in a different way when we're looking at this region. And when we think of Canada, we also have to think of Canada as part of the circumpolar world. A world that's being awoken to all of us in terms of resource potential. Some of you might remember back to John Diefenbaker creating these same sorts of images of this frontier of destiny back in the 1950s. Well, it's again back here with us today. And a lot of this is prompted by climate change, the talk of new access points, owing to big shifts that are fundamentally transforming the region. Does this suggest that we're on a course for conflict or one of cooperation and opportunity? Well, it depends on the image. Some of the images that we get, of course, Official images like this million dollar shot from Operation Nanook 2009 suggest that Canada needs to stand up for itself in the region. That we face a scenario where we need to be muscular and show that this is indeed our domain. On the other hand, we need to remember that we're not the only country in the Arctic. And sometimes our language of the need to protect our Arctic is really misread by our neighbours, be they the Americans, particularly the Russians. And maps like this talking about different Aboriginal peoples around the Arctic remind us sometimes our Southern Canadian views aren't the most representative. We've seen comforting frameworks come out of our national leaders at conferences like the one held in the Lulisat a couple of years ago, stating this talk of a lawless frontier in the Arctic is hogwash. There's an extensive framework that already exists here, and all of us coastal states will adhere to that framework in sorting out our overlapping claims. Don't get worried. But on the other hand, as we look to the future, we see the Arctic as part of a global network, be it land, be it sea, be it air. We see possibilities for challenges, challenges that can be quite ominous, challenges that certainly provoke us to following behind leadership that suggests we need to be firm, we need to show our resolve as a nation. And a Prime Minister's speech in February 2007 really lays out, I think, his formula for understanding both the Arctic and the role of the Canadian forces. Canadians are excited about the government asserting Canada's control and sovereignty. We believe that's one of the big reasons Canadians are excited and support our plans for the Canadian forces. I think it's practically and symbolically hugely important, much more than the dollars spent, and this is going to be a major legacy. 
So we're going to talk tonight about some of the issues. Do we envision a future where there will be stable funding for the Canadian forces in the Arctic? What does practically and symbolically important actually mean? Well, we're fortunate. We have Transformers commanders here with us who are going to tell us perhaps some of their thoughts on the symbolic nature of the Canadian Forces' role, but definitely the practical nature of the Canadian Forces' role, its mission, its future in the region. We've certainly heard a lot from the Prime Minister in the last four years, a northern strategy that's very fo much focused on a security strategy around this idea of use it or lose it, expanding the Canadian Rangers, ordering new Arctic offshore patrol vessels, building a new deep water port, or at least leveraging one that used to exist, up at Nana Civic, launching satellites that even the Americans come to us to access when they're looking for intelligence in the north, and they always tell me that in Washington, very valuable. Major exercises, constructing a Canadian Forces Arctic Training Centre, construction of a polar icebreaker, Arctic response company groups that can go and respond to an emergency, a permanent reserve company up in Yellowknife. Big promises, big commitment, bold vision. Well, perhaps what we have is the Canada First Defence Strategy that identifies specifically the Arctic as one of the CF's core missions, which is key, very much an emphasis, also a promise that there's going to be stable, predictable funding and the right equipment and training, obviously key considerations when we look to the future in the Arctic. Also as promise of the, this pillar of having excellence at home, the Canadian forces must have the capacity to exercise control over and defend Canada's sovereignty. What does that mean? We're fortunate that in our conversation perhaps we'll share some insights in how this is being interpreted. Certainly anything the Canadian forces do must fit within a broader government strategy and this was unveiled in July of 2009 based upon four pillars. Strengthen Canada's sovereignty, this is the one most commonly associated with the Canadian forces. Also protecting environmental heritage, promoting economic and social development for the benefit of Northerners and improving Northern governance. Well how does this speak to the changes that are facing the entire circumpolar world? This document is unclear. Yes we have boundaries that need to be worked out. This is going to take a while, but it's not a race. It's a collaborative process, a shared commitment to international law with our neighbours. The disputes over things like the Beaufort and Hans Island and the Northwest Passage, the document says, are actually well managed. We can agree to disagree over the status. At the end of the day, we're going to sit down and negotiate, but we're going to resolve anything in accordance with international law. Well, surely this is naive. What about those crazy Russians, right? Archer Chilingarov, some of you will remember three years ago, planting that titanium flag under the sea ice at the bed of the North Pole, saying this was an extension of Russia's ex continental shelf, right? North Pole belongs to us, Santa Claus, his postal code is ho ho ho, right? He's Canadian, for sure. What are the Russians signaling to us? They've got big development plans, huge development plans for the Arctic, particularly in the maritime domain that are bold and certainly there's questions whether these are feasible in light of their own lack of diversity in terms of their economy but should we not be anticipating Russia being a belligerent in the region? We've heard senior members of their land forces saying we need to go set out training plans for troops that might be engaged in combat missions. Certainly Canada should be prepared then. What about these overflights that many of us have read about in the newspapers? Bomber flights that resumed three years ago that we've had to scramble our jets to go and intercept, not in Canadian airspace, there was a little bit of a fumble on the part of the Minister of National Defence when he said that, but outside of our airspace. Nevertheless, Russian bombers flying directly beeline for our airspace understandably causes us jitters. And certainly our Minister of Foreign Affairs in identifying Canada as an energy superpower and an Arctic superpower, I mean big bold words, says of course we need to take our responsibilities seriously, that's why we have to stand up to aggressive Russian behaviour, make sure our northern security is preserved and the Canadian forces have a real role to play in defending our sovereignty. How does the world see this? Well here's a bit of a sensational article out of Pravda, I say tongue in cheek with you, but in March 2010 what does Prime Minister Harper have in common with the Minister of Defence? He shares a sinister Hip hypocritical and belligerent discourse bordering on the lunatic fringe of the international community. Yet Canada's newfound megalomania is the least of Russia's worry. How can climate change in the Arctic threaten her national security? From Canada, Russia has become used to seeing and hearing positions of sheer arrogance, unadulterated insolence, and provocative intrusion. What these statements hide is Canada's nervousness at the fact that international law backs up Russia's claim to a hefty slice of the Arctic and that international law will favour Russia in delineating the new Arctic boundaries. I don't think this is the way we perceive of ourselves. Is this the message that we're projecting? 
And are we the little dog yapping over the pole at the Russian bear, which really possesses the power, and if it chose, could come and gobble us up in a heartbeat? Well, senior members of the Canadian Forces assure us this is not the case. Vice Admiral McFadden, Chief of the Maritime Staff, I think, presented a very sobering speech in Washington in April of 2010 saying, let me be clear, we do not see a conventional military threat in the Arctic in the foreseeable future. We'll talk about what the foreseeable future is and how the Canadian Forces undertakes planning, anticipates threats. But certainly, Admiral McFadden said the real challenges in the region are related to safety and security. What does that mean in terms of the Canadian Forces? Well, our Arctic foreign policy certainly suggests that our vision should be a positive one. It's one based upon stable, rules-based, region with clearly defined boundaries, dynamic economic growth and trade, vibrant northern communities, healthy and productive ecosystems. Obviously variables that must factor into the way the Canadian Forces operates. We don't anticipate any military challenges is the key. And we've seen international cooperation this year. Bilateral front, Canada and Denmark, right? Two arch enemies over Hans Island. Sitting down and working out a memorandum of understanding on Arctic defense, security and operational cooperation. We've seen Russia and Norway reach a boundary agreement on continental shelf that had been simmering for more than 40 years. The Arctic Council is in the process of creating a binding search and rescue instrument. We've seen the International Maritime Organization make great strides towards a mandatory polar code to make sure that ships all have to adhere to a common international set of regulations. What role does this play for NATO as well? Well, all of this, of course, fits in what's often talked about not as a whole of government approach. A need to recognize the Canadian Forces is not the primary responder in the Arctic in most capacities. Instead, it plays a supporting role. What supporting role will it have to play as the Arctic expands, as transportation networks grow, as very interesting developments in places like the Katikmiut region, in the center around Bathurst Inlet and Cambridge Bay, and the creation of a Nunavut Resources Corporation in recent months, suggest that this region really will become a destination for investment, be it Canadian or foreign, and a lot of new infrastructure. Do we have time? Major international reports suggest that talk about the Northwest Passage being viable in the short term is not going to happen. What does that space give us in terms of an ability to plan ahead? Or is this sort of thinking that done by civilians who are out of touch with how quickly a region like this, with all of these resources, can explode and become a powder keg? Certainly Northerners are insistent, however, that sovereignty begins at home. And that if we're going to think about what Canada wants to do in the North, we better do so based upon close collaboration with the people who make it their home all of the time. Are we an Arctic superpower? How do we show that? How does the Canadian forces justify getting the investments when Northerners complain that social indicators point to issues like homelessness and lots of other issues relating to abuse, violent crimes in communities? How does that balance where we allocate our scarce resources as a nation? Again, these are the sort of questions I hope that we're going to broach tonight. And thank you very much. I'll now turn the microphone over to General Collin. I'm going to try to speak a little bit faster than Whitney did just to... <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for having me here this evening. It is truly a great pleasure. I know we often say that, but just in the reception beforehand upstairs, to meet a number of you and to realize the different backgrounds that are in this room this evening uh, is very exciting for me, and I'm looking forward to the question period. So I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can, but in order to provide a little bit of focus for the question period, I thought I would sow some seeds, give you some initial thoughts, if you will. Uh, one point of clarification before I begin, I'm sure the Premier of the province would think it's a great idea, but the Prime Minister might have a different opinion when my introducer said that I was in charge of the Army of Ontario. Um, it was actually the Army in Ontario, and I, I, we should not lose sight of that reality. So, what do I want to talk about? I want to, again, I want to sow some seeds. I'm going to touch on what you see on this slide, a bit about how the North is important strategically for Canada, then transition through what the Canadian forces are doing there, what the challenges are, and then a, little, a few miscellaneous points near the end. 
I suppose the first point we all need to recognize, and we kind of nod up and down every time we hear this, the north is a vast area. Superimposed on this side, slide is all of Europe. So it gives you a bit of an idea of the size that we are talking about. 40% of Canada's land mass, 75% of our coastline resides in the north. Clearly one of the big issues is weather, climate change, and the ice. And whether the ice is in fact receding to the point where the various passages in the north will become significant routes. Shown on this slide here it, graph, uh, are two pictures of the different sea ice between 2008 and 2020. This slide here shows the average ice from the period of uh, 79 till 2007, so about a 30-year period compared to the ice that actually existed in 2007. That, of course, uh, ice, of course, is the big issue up there. And this picture here is of, a, of one of our Coast Guard vessels. And what you see just beside the vessel is new ice. N ice that occurs each and every year. And quite frankly, a lot of it melts. Some of it turns into chunks. And icebreakers can break through it. But of course, what you see in front of the vessel is the old ice, the multi-year ice. And there isn't, a, there isn't a, an icebreaker known to mankind that could deal with large parts of that situation. So whether or not the ice does or does not exist is a significant factor within the north. There are a number of different passages that exist. The Northwest Passage we always talk about, but I would also like to highlight to you the Northern Sea Route on the other side of the Arctic, which is in fact shorter and more easily navigated. The point to these routes is, for example, if you want to take something from Europe to Southeast Asia, you can get all sorts of estimates, but the trip will probably cost you in the neighborhood of a million dollars less and 40% less in terms of time. A very significant economic consideration. Staying with economics for a while, um, if I was to quote Rumsfeld, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, th this map here from a government of Canada uh, northern strategy Show, uh, shows the current resources when it comes to minerals. The point I want to make on this map is note the amount of blue. The blue is the geological mapping that does not meet current standards. In other words, we haven't mapped it to even determine the potential of resources. Only those areas in green are where we actually have mapped to a point where we can actually determine the potential. So again, how much is there in the north, we really don't know. What we do know is that it is growing exponentially. And this slide here, I'm not going to speak to any details on it, gives you a bit of an idea of the various companies and organizations that are working to exploit the mineral deposits in the north. And this grows each and every year. Same thing for oil and gas. This slide again shows you what has been properly mapped and not mapped in the north. This slide shows you the current activities of the various oil and gas companies. In 2007 alone, over $400 million was used just for exploration of oil and gas minerals in, the, in Canada's north. Commercial traffic is also increasing in the north. These are the adventurous routes, the ecotourists, the various vessels that go, tr transit through the north on a seasonal basis. And the point I want to highlight simply on this slide is you start to see a growth in activity in the north. Not only in terms of ecotourism, but in terms of overall um, shipping within the north. And again, except for the little drop this past year, uh, you see the continual growth since 2004. And what are the impacts of that when we speak about sovereignty and security? This summer alone there were two major vessels that went aground. One was, uh, which one do I have here? One was a cruise ship which required the Canadian Coast Guard with some support from the Canadian forces to deal with the passengers and crews on that cruise ship and another was a cargo ship. So. With that as a bit of background, what is the Canadian Forces presence in the North as we speak today? 
All of our northern activity is overviewed or overwatched by what we call Joint Task Force North, JTFN. It is a headquarters, a relatively small headquarters, and various different resources that exist in the north. One of those key resources are Canadian Rangers. They are not only in the territories, they are also in the northern part of most of our provinces, and they are, for the most part, Aboriginal people who play a very key role for the Canadian Forces, primarily surveillance when they go out on patrols, and also play a very large role in search and rescue operations. This map here shows the dispersion of all of the Canadian Ranger patrol groups throughout northern Canada. A patrol group will be anywhere from about 15 to 100 to 150 Canadian Rangers. Of note, most of these Ranger patrol groups now have the Junior Ranger program. I don't know how many of you are aware with the, of the Cadet program, uh, a program basically in southern Canada that takes Canada's youth and for all intent and purposes teaches them how to be good Canadian citizens. We have done a very similar program with the Aboriginal people in the north through the Junior Ranger program, taking the young, uh, the, the children from ages 13 to about age 18 and teaching them self-discipline, skills of the land, first aid, map reading, and other skills that may be useful to them as they continue to live and in some cases survive in the north. In addition to the rangers and the headquarters that controls activity in the north, the Navy, Army, and Air Force have been working in the north for quite some time. Currently, this slide depicts some of the activity that is going on uh, within the north from those three services. And I'm not going to speak about any of it right now, but I'm happy to deal with any specific questions during the question period. In addition to a presence in the north through various elements of the Canadian forces, we do train quite extensively in the north. Perhaps not as much as we would like, and again, we can deal with that in question period, but there are three major exercises that occur on a yearly basis where Canadian forces personnel working with the rangers will conduct training in the north, and they're shown here on this slide. Although the Canadian forces are present in the north, it is not without difficulty. And again, this slide is simply shown as perhaps a genesis for some questions later on, but safe to say that it is extremely difficult to operate in the north. It is not the same as working in southern Canada. Not only is it the vastness of the territory, not only is it that you need specialist skills, otherwise you will die up there, but because of the austere conditions, sustainment or logistic support becomes critical. And thinking that piece through is fundamental for any organization that wishes to operate in the North, be it commercial or any of our other government departments or indeed the Canadian Forces. Just to give you an idea of how difficult those conditions would, can be, this is an example of CFS Alert, Canadian Forces Station Alert, the most northerly permanently inhabited community in the world. Um, some 90 kilometers from CFS Alert, where you see the arrow on the left, we set up a small little ice station. And that picture was taken on the 20th of April. People in tents sort of thing. All around that ice station, in black, or the dark colors, are ice crevices, shearing of ice, etc. Look how much that changed within a three-day period, the slide on the right. Needless to say, the ice station did not stay there. To close this out before we open it up to a bit of a discussion and then questions and answers, I, I, I'd like to make two points. First one is, we ought to stop confusing the terms sovereignty and security. Sovereignty, by definition, if you take a look in a dictionary, would talk about a nation's ability to govern over its territory. And good governance is far more than just having security. You must consider the economic, the geopolitical, the social, 
and, in fact, governments and rule of law issues. So unfortunately, a number of people, when they speak about the North, seem to use the terms sovereignty and governance, uh, sorry, sovereignty and security interchangeably. And I would argue that that is not the case. But when you speak about sovereignty, almost every government department has a role to play. Some of them also have a role to play in security. But we need to broaden our understanding because if we only rely on security partners to deal with our North, then we are selling ourselves short when it comes to truly exercising Canadian sovereignty over the North. And finally, we must manage expectations. The North is a huge place. You see it here. The Arctic Ocean all right, is approximately the size of Russia. The ice cap is about three or four times the size of Texas. You could take the entire Canadian forces, all 100,000 of us, when you count the regular force, the reserves, and our civilian um, workforce, our public servants, you could take all of us and drop us into the north, and it would still be a drop in the bucket. So we need to manage expectations. We need to focus our thoughts, focus our plans, and focus our efforts to truly ensure security in the north and also contribute to sovereignty in the north. Thank you. So the way we're going to, we're gonna, I guess we've already kicked this off, but uh, the way we're going to follow up for the next little while is I'm going to pose a series of questions. We're going to have a free-flowing discussion, almost a, I guess a, a dining room, living room conversation, hopefully, about some of the issues that have been raised and, and some of the broader issues relating to the Canadian forces in the Arctic. So I guess to pick up on your last point that you introduced in terms of expectation management um, and dealing with a region that's obviously filled with a profound amount of uncertainty uh, given, the, given the changing conditions. How, from a planning perspective, a strategic planning perspective, does the Canadian forces interpret the idea of the need to provide a presence? You called on the need for focus, given that it's such a vast region, 40% of Canada's landmass. How is that interpreted? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is define presence. Are we talking about a permanent presence? Or are we talking about the ability to be where we need to be when the situation arises? Um, that is not 100% clear, depending on who you speak to. Uh, at the end of the day, I think it's going to be a bit of a combination of both. We're going to need some form of permanent presence in the North, but the reality is you can't be everywhere, all, uh, even if you wanted to be, but the weather and climactic conditions alone could not permit you to have a permanent presence everywhere. So we will be into this notion of occasional presence or routine presence or periodic presence, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then the, the real trick will be being at the right place at the right time or having sufficient warning so that you can be at the right place at the right time. And that leads into the, all of the discussions about um, having proper surveillance of the North, being able to know what's going on in the North so that we do have the ability to react. I mean, if we take a look at the Navy alone, and I'll let Serge comment on for a moment, they are very limited in terms of when they can be up there. And even with the new Arctic Offshore Patrol ship, um, although that will be an increased capability, they still won't be able to be everywhere throughout the, se throughout the seasons. Serge. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, sir. Uh, the, the comments about being able to understand what's going on in our uh, three major ocean uh, spaces, uh, and in particular in the Arctic, is it, we have a huge problem of scale. A very small Canadian forces, as, uh, as uh, General Cullen pointed out, uh, but a, an approach to understanding what is going on in the approaches to Canada, its, its uh, oceanic and aerospace uh, domains, in order to be able to take the resources that are available to the whole of government and getting them to the right place at the right time. When I was uh, in the first half of my career uh, preparing for the possibility of conflict with the, the Soviet Union, a 
possibility that we uh, uh, were working hard to prevent and luckily never occurred. The understanding of what was going on in our ocean and air spaces is, was fundamentally different than it is now. A merchant ship was something to be protected in getting supplies from North America to, uh, to Europe. Nowadays, a merchant ship is something that we have to understand is presumed to be not secure or a potential threat until we determine otherwise. You saw the figures that General Collin indicated in terms of the several dozens or so of, uh, of, uh, of uh, vessels that are in the north. In the Atlantic and the Pacific, we're talking about thousands of vessels. And we no longer just need to know where they are and where they're headed. But in today's age, with a much more comprehensive uh, um, set of challenges and threats to our societies that 9-11 demonstrated uh, uh, very uh, uh, potently to, uh, to, to the world, we need to understand where's that vessel, where was it loaded? What's on its manifest? Where is it going? If it's a vessel of specific interest, what's its layout? What kind of machinery arrangements? And so on and so forth, in case that vessel needs to be disabled or bordered by, or bordered by, uh, by special forces. So the range of information that's required in order to get the precious assets to the right place at the right time for the right effect involves a orchestration of uh, intelligence, military, commercial, uh, and uh, other agencies working together in order to provide what we call domain awareness. And that's one of the things that, uh, one of the areas in which Canada has demonstrated world leadership. We have people coming from all over the world to understand how we in Canada provide maritime domain awareness for uh, uh, operations in all of our ocean and air uh, approaches. A couple of questions flowing out of that. First of all, you're, you're setting up scenarios where we need to be able to bring desired effects to a particular situation. What sort of scenario are we anticipating? We looked at those stats showing an increase in volume, still very modest levels. We often tie this to sovereignty, although I don't know what the stats are, but they're incredibly small ships that don't report. Even when it, the, the Nordreg system, the, the reporting system that Canada in place was voluntary, the, the response rates were well above 95%. Even with tempo of increased activity projected over the next five to ten years, is there an escalating threat? And you're bringing up, you know, post 9/11 terrorism. Are these credible threats? I mean, given the volume, given the opportunities, the vulnerabilities that we face on the Atlantic and Pacific coasts, where somebody coming in is not going to face the very difficult operating conditions that have already been outlined, are Canadians to see this as an area where we need to divert already scarce naval resources, air resources, army resources up to the Arctic? Or is this something that's been conjured by certain fear mongers who are preying in essence on Canadians' ignorance of what's actually possible up there? And when we talk about the increasing shipping levels, for example, I still ask, where's the threat to our sovereignty? At the end of the day, these ships are all going in destination shipping. They might be coming from Russia, but if they're going to Churchill, or they're showing up and on any Canadian port, they have to declare that they're on Canadian soil and ask permission. So I guess I sort of ask, what are the scenarios that we're planning for to justify this increased domain awareness and that would set the Arctic apart from just what we're doing as, as normal business practices in the rest of the country? Right. Well, as Admiral McFadden mentioned, there is no recognized conventional military threat to Canada from the north or through the north. Uh, and I think most, most people in academia would agree with that. Our government certainly agrees with that, and the Canadian Forces recognizes that. Um, we have this saying called the strategic corporal. That one corporal in Afghanistan who takes the one shot at the right, wrong time, and it reaches the front page of the Globe and Mail. I would suggest to you that what happens in the North has strategic effect, even though it's incredibly small scale. So the one ship that runs aground, and spills 100 liters of crude oil into the Arctic will have strategic effect. People will pay attention. 
In the large scheme of things, how does that compare to what happened in the Gulf of Mexico this last summer with the major oil spill? It is insignificant. Yes, it will have significant effect on the, the ecosystems, etc. But in terms of scale, as you suggest, uh, it's non-comparable. But it will have strategic effect because immediately it will lead to discussions about whether we are exercising sovereignty, whether we can exercise security of the North, etc. So we, the Canadian Forces, and our other government departments need to be able to show that we can react to incidents in the North, no matter how small they might be, because the strategic impact of not doing that is profound. Well, it's interesting. I, I think those are really important points. I guess part of my question back to you then is you, you phrase it in terms of Canadian Forces and government departments. Is it more appropriate to push other, other government departments before Canadian Forces? Because the scenarios that you're discussing, even with an oil spill, why would the Canadian Forces want to take primary responsibility for responding? This sounds to me something that civilian agencies should have responsibility for. So when we talk about expectations, which you left us with as your final thought, I mean, does the CF, and I, again, I have to be careful I ask this question, um, can you clarify what precisely the Canadian Forces' role is in these security and, and safety scenarios that are, being, that are being laid out? Because to me, it's not unclear that you need to have a military capability. In do. most cases, almost in all cases, whatever were to develop in the North, the Canadian Forces would not be the lead agency. If you're talking about, for example, a ship that runs aground, the Canadian Coast Guard is re responsible for maritime search and rescue, the Canadian Forces are not. If there's an environmental concern, Environment Canada is responsible, not us. If there are illegal migrants, it would be Can Canadian Border Services, uh, not us. However, the reality in the North is that it is so difficult to live and operate in the North that a lot of these agencies require assistance, require support. And this is where the Canadian Forces comes into the fold. We can offer logistic support, we can offer transportation support, and we can offer operators to assist in whatever is going on. So, if there is a major maritime disaster in the North, it is the Canadian Coast Guard, without doubt, and this is very clear cut, that would have the lead. But the Canadian Coast Guard, in and of themselves, would not be able to deal with it. They would require the assistance of the Canadian Forces. So almost any scenario that you could portray up in the north, be it safety, security, or actual defense, unless it is very small, it will need to be a whole of government response. No one agency has the wherewithal to deal with it. So that being said, and, and following this through, there's a discussion then, no conventional military threat. This is where we're sort of agreeing, short term. How do you plan for uncertainty in a region? You mentioned during the Cold War and the way we interacted with our allies, with the Soviets. If all of a sudden that ice cover is receding, and we've seen in the last three to four years a series of very sharp firsts in the region, the, the smallest summer ice extent, 2007, this year, the actual, in terms of volume, the thickness is the lowest ever on record. What does that mean in terms of domain awareness? What does that mean in terms of potential threats down the road because of course as practitioners you can't just be planning for horizon two you know, horizon one horizon two out to 15 years you need to be planning beyond and certainly any vessels that we're purchasing for example these things take a long time to build they're going to be in operation for a long time do you envision scenarios where once the ice is gone from the arctic ocean that this will actually have a destabilizing effect because now submarines won't have it as a safe operating environment in terms of deterrence and by extension we often focus on the Arctic as a region unto itself. How do you, as, as planners at the strategic level, envision the Arctic unfolding as part of broader global networks? Which I think is something that's really under-discussed in terms of the debate in this country. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that those are the discussions that are going on right now. And I don't think um, we have the crystal ball yet, haven't found it. I don't think we ever will. Uh, but I think as the Arctic and the North takes on greater and greater emphasis, it's fair to say that all communities who work in all different organizations who work in the North, including the Canadian Forces, are spending more time thinking about it. For example, we are about to produce within the Canadian Forces a new employment and support concept for the North 
to try to determine exactly what it is we wish to do and how we wish to do it up there. And perhaps I'll hand it back over to Serge again to give you an idea of some of the things that the Navy is thinking about in terms of its future engagement in the North. The, um, <clears throat> the, the, the North is interesting in two main ways. First of all, by virtue of what is going on in that region as we, a country with massive gifts uh, and talents, uh, deal with the consequences of massive change along every human axis, cultural, social, technological, and what have you. The other way the Arctic is interesting to us in terms of force planning scenarios is in what it may instruct us or teach us about what is going on in the wider world as the very forces that are reshaping our North are assuredly at work around the world in many places that unlike Canada or the other uh, uh, northern nations that don't have the same set of gifts or the same uh, privileges in terms of dealing with those kinds of challenges. You know, I guess along those lines, if the issue is resources, and again, the way the legal advisor at Foreign Affairs always talks about this is when it comes to continental shelves and sovereign rights in the Arctic, we're often confused in the popular press. There's a big difference between sovereign rights to seabed resources in the continental shelf versus internal waters where you basically have control as if it's, it's land territory. When we look at resources, is the center of gravity, if you will, military spirit, or is the emphasis, should it not be then on, on foreign investment in Canadian companies? or for direct foreign investment that's going to go and exploit these resources rather than focusing on potential scenarios where, as we read about in some media stories, the Chinese or the Indians decide to build up naval flotillas to come and steal these resources from us. I mean, why is the issue then focused if we're looking at resources on military? And then secondly, where would be the scenario that Canada would need to possess capabilities that we didn't have in concert with our allies. Certainly, if any foreign encroachments were occurring in terms of Canadian resources, things to which we're legally entitled, certainly the Americans and even the Danes would jump in on our side. So I guess part of my question is, we've seen strong rhetoric saying use it or lose it. We've seen a Canada first defense strategy that I've said it often looks like it's a Canada only defense strategy. Where are the opportunities for planning with our allies? And in terms of the resource issues, given the uncertainty in the region, are we not actually, by focusing on military aspects of, of potential risks in the north, not destabilizing the region to such an extent where there's uncertainty, so you're certainly going to discourage any investment. So in one breath, we're talking about the Canadian Arctic as this untapped frontier, you know, the source of our future destiny ec economically, but then we're creating these scenarios that actually make it scary, so no one in their right mind, unless you have a lot, a lot of money, probably not in Canada, and you're going to take a real high-risk venture, you're going to steer clear of the region. Yeah, I, of ideas fit in there. I, I, I actually don't think we are focusing on uh, major security threats to any companies that wish to um, exploit resources in the north. I, I don't think we are at all. There's, there's certainly rhetoric about that. But we pay attention to the amount of development that's going on in the north because there are significant second and third order effects to those developments. Everything from major environmental disasters, which we all know are possible, to the health, safety, and security, not, not the defense, health, safety, and security of increased populations, increased traffic within the north. And it doesn't take much to develop a scenario where, for example, in the dead of winter, a major mining company up in the north has a major fire in its installation and all of a sudden you have 50 to 100 workers and that's really all you'd be talking about who have no power, very little food and no protection from the elements. And how does the government of Canada deal with that? And again, because we are so dispersed and because operating up there is so difficult, even for 50 to 100 people who are in distress, it would probably need to be a whole of government uh, operation to deal with that. And the same thing with environmental concerns. So we pay very much attention to what's going on in the north. 
because of the second and third order effects, and I've only given you a couple, those second and third order effects extend to our international partners. Uh, search and rescue as an example, there's very clear definitions as to which nations will take on which responsibilities in the north, and those will be further refined in the coming years. Um, there, is the there is the idea of international co cooperation for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief applies throughout the world, applies equally in the north. So the, Canada has stated that wherever it, it makes sense to do so, that we wish to take an international approach to operations in the north. That should not be surprising to Canadians. Throughout our history, we have relied on alliances and coalitions and international cooperation to assure our sovereignty and to help those who cannot help themselves. So this is nothing new for Canada as a nation. Just a second before you carry on. General Kala made a very key point that bears repeating when he talked about the relationship between sovereignty and security, and he mentioned the word governance. When we look at the challenges in the North, what we are talking about is a regulated environment, one in which the rule of law obtains for both ourselves and our partners, one in which those spaces are, are to be used lawfully and denied to those who would use it for unlawful purpose. We're talking about the ability to safeguard the environment and to ensure the sustainable and safe exploitation of those resources that are up there. Those are the kinds of things that defense planners talk about, which we take for granted in the Atlantic and the Pacific in which Canadians expect us to be able to assist in regulating those environments, and we will assuredly be supporting the regulation of our North. But certainly our key allies have a very different legal interpretation of the Northwest Passage than we do. Canada has maintained officially since 1985 that these are internal waters subject to the full suite of Canadian sovereignty, all of our governance, all of our regulations. The Americans, European Union, other maritime nations are very adamant to say this is an international strait. It contains two bodies of high seas, which means whether it's been used or not in the past, it can be used and therefore it's open. And, and one of your professors at U.S. Navy War College uh, is quite insistent, James Kraska, you know, on these points. How do you manage that from a, a strategic planning perspective? I mean, clearly here we have a fundamental disagreement with our key ally and neighbor. How, how, does the, how has this worked? Well, certainly within the uh, foreign affairs policy statement on the north, um, they, they downplay that issue. They believe it will eventually come to a negotiated sell settlement or that we will continue to agree to disagree, but we will manage it accordingly. From a Canadian forces point of view, quite frankly, it doesn't matter a whole lot. I mean, whether it is an international strait or not, if there are ships in distress or ships that are not following uh, international law of the sea or whatever, then uh, from a security point of view, that will have to be dealt with. And the Canadian forces may or may not have a role in that. Just by way of reminder, the Canadian forces have three fundamental roles. Defense, and that's more or less the traditional defense that everyone envisions. But we do have mandated roles to play in security and in safety within this country. So I don't think whether or not it is or is not an, an international strait is terribly relevant to establishing the baseline security and safety considerations within it and dealing with the second and third order effects. But it is a fascinating area of discussion. Apparently there's a, a communications company out there that wants to invest $1.2 billion to actually lay a fiber optic cable from Asia to Europe through the Northwest Passage. I don't think we've thought all that through just yet. Certainly, uh, at the most recent meeting between the U.S. Navy's Chief of Naval Operations, the head of that uh, great naval service, and the head of our Navy, their discussions weren't about the disagreement over the Northwest Passage and its status in the understanding of the provisions of the law of the sea. Their discussions were from the head of the greatest navy in the world to the head of the best. To Dean, how can we work together 
in order to address common challenges and problems. It gets back to what General Collins said. The, the North is the, is the most austere, most difficult environment in the world to operate. It is absolutely unforgiving to the unprepared. They will die if they're incompetent. So nations collaborate with one another. And uh, as a result of discussions between Canada Command and U.S. Northern Command, uh, an invitation was made to the U.S. Uh, uh, Navy and to the Danish Navy in order to observe, and I, I believe it was the uh, military element of Operation Nanook last summer. And I fully expect that the, the two countries will continue to work together, military to military, in order to learn how to cooperate in that very difficult environment because it sure is a whole lot different than it is anywhere else in the world. I mean, another example, sorry, is, is Hans Island. 1.3 square kilometers, that's the size of the island. A very emotive issue, but yet, in terms of security and cooperation in the north, the Canadian government and the Danish government, the Canadian military and the Danish military, are working together on a yearly basis on all sorts of various activities in the north. So yes, there are these geopolitical or high strategic issues that need to be sorted out by the government, but right now, I don't believe, nor does our government believe, based on their policy statements, that these are in any way limiting to what needs to be done in the north. But it is true as well, I think, though, that we're getting very mixed messaging from the government in Ottawa. On the one hand, we're getting the sense that there's a race for resources, that we're behind, that we need to stand up for Canada. Use it or lose it is a classic phrase. I mean, troubling to me, what country in their right mind suggests to the world that they can possibly lose something that they're confident that they already have? It's very bizarre because we're raising doubts and a lot of uh, you know, international colleagues of mine pass that along. Very weird messaging. Then we've got this confidence messaging, reassuring, which we're hearing here tonight for sure. Don't worry, everything's in hand. We can agree to disagree. But can we not agree to disagree only until the Americans decide that they're not content and they want to make a point? I mean, at what point do we prepare for contingencies? Do we have an obligation to prepare for contingencies? As you said, it's non-kinetic roles for the Canadian forces. I can't imagine a realistic scenario where we're ever come, going to come to military blows with the Danes or the Americans. But how viable into the future is what I would say is an extension of the Cold War relationships that existed. There's lots of uncertainty. Can we really count on our friends staying friends as we march you know, 20, 30 years into the future? Yeah, and clearly I'm not going to, co to, to comment about what the government of Canada should or should not do. You know, uh, that's why they are elected and, and they will figure that out. Um, but I will, I, I will say this about any Canadian government that would be in power. They have a, they have a difficult situation to deal with because on the one hand we wish to exercise sovereignty in the north and a lot of people believe that exercising sovereignty means that you have to have a homegrown solution or a Canadian only solution to a problem but the other school of thought is Canada has never gone alone Canada has always had a history of relying on international cooperation and international partnerships in order to further Canada as a nation. And personal opinion, according to John Collin, it's worked out pretty well for us over the last uh, century. Um, so on the one hand, you have the school of thought that says, we need to go it alone, we need, we need to exercise our sovereignty by ourselves in Canada. And then the other school of thought that says, but we need to further international partnership. Those two come to a direct collision in the North because of the number of nations that all have interests in the North. It is interesting. I mean, I agree with your comments. And again, this is a comment as opposed to anything I'm asking you to respond to. But it is interesting because it is a dilemma. As Canadians, are we prepared to make concessions, say, on boundary issues when we've had such a strident message from Ottawa that they, we need to stand up for what is ours? Are we, have we prepped the ground on the political level to actually make the concessions now that the Arctic Foreign Policy Statement has said, first priority, try to negotiate settlements? Have we actually set up a context where a government that's been so strident that it's use it or lose it can now shift and actually make a convincing message that sovereignty is not threatened and that indeed our allies, the Americans, right? As some of you might remember, the day after Stephen Harper became Prime Minister, David Wilkins, the US ambassador, was at the University of Western Ontario giving a talk on some subject. 
asked a very innocent question by an undergraduate student about the Northwest Passage, and he replied as a diplomat would, we've had a long-standing agreement to disagree with Canada on the status of these waters. Stephen Harper comes out, you know, fist swinging the next day saying Canada will not be pushed around by the Americans, these are our waters, and so be it. There's so much political capital to be gained by whipping up these issues, I guess I wonder, can a government midstream that's based so much of its legacy on these issues switch and now say, in fact, the Americans are our best friends, which is what these statements say. And is the Canadian public going to have a tolerance? Again, I think it's a real dilemma, and I think you've laid it out very, very fairly in terms of a lot of history that's very positive. We've been talking here about secondary and tertiary effects, and I wonder if you have any thoughts in terms of how the latest emphasis on, on Canadian force operations in the North may affect Northerners. We have on the one hand a recent report uh, co-authored by uh, Dean of Arts at the University of Waterloo, Ken Coates, through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, saying that the military should be the backbone of the new North. We have Mary Simon coming out last week, the president of Inuit Tepere Kanatami, the Inuit representation organization in Canada, saying militarization is what threatens Northerners. In fact, this notion of the military as the core backbone is completely wrong. We've got all these social indicators saying there's a lot of other social issues that need to be the focus. This, I think, ties back to questions of presence. Is it inherent that increasing the tempo of military operations in the north militarizes the region? Well, I think I addressed that earlier on, Whitney. We, this is not militarization. This is regulation. Look around the world at where you see coastal states that are able to regulate matters in their own approaches, their air approaches and their maritime spaces. These are well-governed places where business can be done, where people can expect the protection of the law, because coastal states are in a position to do that. There are parts of the world where that, those basic sets of protections have broken down. Off the Horn of Africa, failed state of Somalia, we are dealing in the international community with the consequences of an unregulated environment, one that is beyond the pale of law. In the Gulf of Guinea, studies have indicated that the 10 or so coastal states in uh, the uh, west coast of Africa have lost in the order of $100 billion US in the last decade because they are unable to regulate their coastal areas that the international law provides to them. That's $100 billion that doesn't go into the pockets of their citizens, that doesn't allow the governments to address the very real challenges and concerns that they have in developing their societies. That's maritime insecurity that eventually exports itself, as we're seeing now, into Europe through the migrations of peoples looking for a better life. Regulation. Regulated comments are fundamental to the way this world works. And so what we're talking about in terms of the domestic context as a coastal state applies right across the world. There's no, for a naval officer, there is absolutely no difference in my global perspective between what happens at home and what happens abroad. We operate on a single ice sheet that covers 70% of the globe. And what happens over there matters over here. We have an army that is doing magnificent work in Afghanistan because what mattered in that country matters here. Those are the kinds of things that we're trying to deal with and, and talking about. Whitney, I, I, I would like to touch quickly on, um, you, you, you talked about second and third order effects. And I, I think this is a fundamental point that we all need to recognize as we move forward. And this is tough work to figure out. But I'll give you a couple examples of where we need to be careful, and we truly need to think this through. We've talked about an increased presence in the North, be it military or other government departments. Well, if you were to take another 50 people, it's not a lot, but take another 50 people and plop it into some of these northern communities, you would completely discombobulate their entire way of life. Right now, they barely bring in enough food for their year when they can bring in food. 50 people will force them to completely rethink that. Fresh water will be an issue. Sewage will be an issue. Housing would be an issue 
if you tried to put 50 additional people into almost any community in the north. Another example, we talk often about in the military the idea of we go north all the time on exercises, we have all sorts of construction engineers. Wouldn't it be great when we go up on an exercise that we actually build something? Because that's what we do. And then at the end of the exercise, we'll leave and whatever we've built, we'll leave behind for the community. Sounds like a great idea. Let's talk about the second and third order effects. There's probably one construction company in that community. That construction company is going to say, hey, you're taking business away from me. Or even if we give them business and help, us, help them help, or they help us build it, the community is going to go, wait a minute, that construction company was supposed to be fixing the sewer system this year. But because you gave them more money, they're now building the town hall. But that's not our priority, that's your priority. Immune systems in the north are nowhere near as developed as in the south. What's going to happen when we have increased numbers of southerners coming into these communities and a lot of them are transients? They're for short periods of time, in and out constantly, and they're walking microbiology experiments, from a northerner's point of view anyway. So it's, it's not as evident as, hey, let's do A and therefore we'll be good. We really do need to think through the second and third order effects. That's why, again, it needs to be whole of government and perhaps even, no, not perhaps, more importantly, we need to engage in very extensive dialogue with the local communities before we take off half bent with our southern ideas that may actually cause more harm than good. Well, it's interesting, you bring up priorities, which I think is always key when we're looking at uh, how the government's going to proceed in general. I, I was at a conference in Calabit a couple of weeks ago on sovereignty and economic infrastructure, and uh, Parliamentary Secretary, the Prime Minister, and the Minister of Health, Minister responsible for, uh, for Arctic issues, were there and said very clearly, we're entering into a new era. This is what they chose to announce at an Arctic sovereignty uh, meeting. They ch chose to emphasize, we're entering a new era, of course, fiscal responsibility, getting back into black, we've done our spending any new initiatives in Canada are going to have to come out of existing envelopes. And in fact, we're going to be tightening our belts, not widening them. And this was a message being sent to northern business people, community developers in the north. In terms of the Canadian forces and planning ahead, are you working on assumptions that you have to deal with just working with the assets or the capabilities that may be developed and have already been announced? Or are there plans for increased uh, or, or further developments down the road. And I think of things, we talk about logistics and support, we can look at, you know, 50 people going into a community and, and definitely damaging that community potentially. At the same time, if you have replenishment vessels that are ice strengthened, theoretically, you could actually support communities in different ways. Or if you had bigger runways that were hardened and could support globe masters, you could actually bring in supplies more expediently to the north. So I guess I wonder, is this a scenario from the standpoint of today, and I don't know if this is an appropriate question, but in terms of your planning, is the anticipation, is the sort of the, the understanding that you've already been told what you're going to get, work around what you already have, and build a strategy around that? Or is there a sense of, of designing more boldly and, and seeing I mean, I think it's fair to say that no, or, no organization has a whole bunch of extra people kicking around that can do work. So the majority of our emphasis right now is on those projects and initiatives where we know we either have guaranteed funding line or an anticipated funding line for it. That does not preclude by any way, shape, or form. There are people in the organization who are very much focused on the next steps, the next spiral. You know, what else should we be suggesting to government, suggesting to industry, suggesting to our whole of government partners that we ought to take a look at? But there is no doubt that the priority in terms of getting the job done is on those projects where we have an announced funding line or an anticipated announced funding line and we are working in a resource-constrained environment, of that there is no doubt. Gentlemen, thank you for that excellent discussion. Now for the challenging questions. We have questions from the audience. And um, some of these are open, so I'll just throw them out on the floor and, and let you duke it out. <laughs> the first one, though, is for our, our commanders in uniform. 
Does an increase in the Canadian military presence in the Arctic pose a security dilemma that will cause our northern neighbours to increase their presence as well? No. No. Um, listen, what we're talking about in terms of increased presence in the north uh, in the foreseeable future, the next five years, maybe even ten years, is uh, quite frankly relatively insignificant from our, part, from our international partners' point of view in terms of posing any sort of threat to them whatsoever. We're talking about Arctic offshore patrol ships that have an ice-breaking capability. We're talking about a berthing and refueling port. We're talking about an Arctic training facility. And we're talking about a few more exercises in the north, uh, a slightly larger scale. None of that, none of that will be viewed as menacing by any of our uh, by any other nation. Let me jump in. I mean, now I get to have fun because I get to just comment as opposed to asking the, the questions. <laughs> um, I, I agree very much with your analysis as well and, and Captain Bertrand, your comments. There's some ideas circulating out there about an Arctic arms race and my good friend Rob Hubert at the University of Calgary, the primary purveyor of polar peril out there, insists that there's already an Arctic arms race going on. In fact, I thought the description about a region with regulations that it's actually positive. It's, it's stability building and confidence building to see Canada reinvesting in military capabilities. To leave it as a void where you don't have capabilities first and foremost breeds a lack of confidence on a domestic front which leads you to react as opposed to respond with some sort of confidence. That's, that would be my first thought on this. Secondly, it's interesting, I've, I've got an article coming out in an international journal, so another plug for CIC early in the new year, talking about Canada and Russia. And what's interesting is, even though both countries are crystal clear recognizing that they actually have more common interests than they do points of potential conflict in the Arctic, they're playing off what can be cast as aggressive moves by one another to justify investments in their domestic armed forces. So the belligerent rhetoric, the tough rhetoric, is very much designed for a domestic audience to justify investments in rebuilding forces more generally. And the Arctic is a convenient pretext because you know whether you're in Russia or in Canada, you just touch a raw nerve. You can get right to the pulse of a country by referring to this threat to sovereignty. So as much as I very much agree from any objective analysis of variables and future scenarios, this is not going to spiral. Again, there's a political layer of messaging to all of this that if you're sitting in the Prime Minister's office in Canada and saying, you know, this can be a legacy of my government, one of the reasons why Canadians are interested in reinvesting in Canadian forces is because they're interested in their Arctic, what's the political incentive to downplaying the cause for alarm? You're downplaying the rationale for investing in the Canadian forces, which is a legacy project. Again, I just put that out there as food for thought because I think it plays into these, these broader ideas. And obviously I'm not asking for a comment on that. <laughs> you're not going to get one. <laughs> We may not get... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I think there's an important thing to understand about uh, the Arctic as a part of the globe. One of the reasons that we are confident that issues will be resolved through the rule of law and by diplomats is because, fundamentally, all the national interests of the five Arctic coastal states are aligned. This is unique in the world. There are other parts of the world where fundamental national interests are potentially in collision. But in the Arctic, where you, and you look at, you recall the, uh, the slides that were put up by both Whitney and Gerald Collin. If you look at where those resources are to be found, they are all to be found in a way that the international law, the Article 76, the legal uh, extension of the continental shelf, and so on, most of the resources, if not all of them, already fall in well-regulated manner to the coastal states themselves. So there is no, this is not a, uh, a, a wild gold rush or the opening of the West without a framework of collaboration. The framework is already there. Most of the resources are to be found there are already well accounted for in that international treaty, the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. And it is in the invested, deep vested interest of all the coastal states to make sure that they play by the rules of the game. That is not the case everywhere else 
in the world. And one of the areas that we should be looking at carefully as Canadians is how similar issues over oceanic resources, for example, are being played out in the South China Sea, where not all the partners view the international law or have the same level of vested interest. And it's there that the potential for confrontation uh, is very real that will need to be managed very, very carefully by the states there and supported by the international community. But certainly, every expectation in the North is that it will be regulated, it won't be militarized, and our differences, such as they are, will be dealt with through the due process of international law. Thank you. This one's heading in a little bit of a different direction, a bit of a hot topic. In the post-Cold War era, why does the government say we need the new F-35 fighters to defend our northern sovereignty? Throw that one out there. Um, I will not comment on the decision of the Government of Canada to, pr to purchase the F-35 over any other fighter aircraft. The reality of the day is that our current fighter aircraft, the F-18, will eventually cease to be a useful fighter aircraft because it will simply reach the end of its lifespan. I mean, and that applies to any piece of equipment on the face of the planet. We don't keep cars for 100 years. Um, aircraft have a lifespan as well. So what is beyond refute is that our current fighter aircraft will at some point or, no, uh, or another cease to be useful. What is equally clear is if Canada does wish to exercise its defense of its homeland, that some form of platform in the air that can intercept things coming in from the air, identify them and if necessary shoot them down is required. Sounds a lot like a fighter aircraft. Um, so there's very little debate in the military community that we require a fighter aircraft. Beyond that, you can get into all sorts of debates and procurement of major military equipment is always political because there is uh, regional benefits, regional economic benefits that need to be considered. There is uh, cooperation with our allies that needs to be considered. There is uh, sharing of technology considerations. The list goes on and on and on. So we, we in the military don't kid ourselves. We know that any crown project, any major purchase of equipment is going to be political. Therefore, it is up to the politicians to make those sorts of decisions. We identify the requirement and the politicians take it from there. <laughs> well, just following up, I think that's a, I think that's a very fair and, and solid answer. And I, when we look at, again, I'm going to dance around the issue of procurement as well. Those are political decisions at the end of the day. When we look at the effects, it, there's a bigger debate out there as to whether or not, I guess, we need to have jet fighters. I mean, I'm very strongly on the side of yes, and you do need a replacement. And uh, again, not being in uniform, I can say, show me the better alternative to the F-35 and maybe I'll consider. But so far from what I've seen, this is, a, this is a completely appropriate choice. Maybe the procurement process ruffles some political feathers, have a political debate about it, but at the end of the day, is this a platform that's going to be useful? Sure. Is it a particularly Arctic-oriented platform, which is what we're largely hearing in the media? I mean, my God, some Russian flights take place over the coast of Newfoundland, and by God, this is going to pose threats to the Arctic, we need F-35s. This is what happened in August. I sort of think to myself, here again, the Arctic is the touchstone, it's the hot button issue, everything relating to the F-35 then gets extrapolated to the Arctic and the need for Arctic sovereignty and security. I think that's where the stretch comes in. The debate over the F-35 and the points of debate over the F-35 in my mind should be divorced from the Arctic where the play, the, the dance that we do as members of NATO with the Russians in Arctic airspace, it goes both ways. It's a bigger question of whether we need this capability. I think we do. The other question coming out lately in some op-eds is whether or not it should be joint strike fighters or fixed wing aircraft to perform search and rescue in the Arctic. So if this becomes about the Arctic, then fine. What we need are replacements for twin otters. That's a ridiculous either or logical fallacy in my mind. I Going think, and making um, a choice on search and rescue is a different matter. Yeah, here's what I would offer in that. Defense planners 
don't have the luxury of looking at today's world and assuming it will always be thus. We have to look 40 to 50 years out because from the time that an idea is translated into a major complex weapon system such as a, a, a fifth generation fighter or a frontline warship or a major uh, main battle tank. That process of gestation through capability, through end of life, is a 50-year decision. I can guarantee you the next class of warships that is built in Canada will still be at sea in 2050. And so we have to try to understand what that world is going to be like and provide to the government of Canada not this government of Canada, but a government for which a prime minister is not even born. A range of options for a contingency that we cannot envisage. Our job as defense planners is to determine what is the range of our possible futures. And then to provide our advice to government as to the best set of tools in order to be able to do the work and provide to the men and women of the Canadian Forces who do, after all, dangerous work. The kinds of tools that they need for decades to come. That is why the Chief of the Air Staff has recommended that aircraft to the Government of Canada. And if the Chief of Air Staff thinks that's the right aircraft, it's the right aircraft. Now, other issues, political or procurement others, that, that's for other people to sort out. But the requirement is actually a very good one. This one's open floor again. How do other countries, US, Russia, assert sovereignty in their Arctic? How do we compare? What about China? Um, Canada Command, the organization that, that I'm with that is responsible for all things military in the Arctic, works very closely with an organization in the States called Northern Command. And Northern Command has responsibility for continental United States, Mexico, Alaska, and its part of the North. I will tell you that in terms of our thought processes, in terms of our development of concepts, in terms of our ability to analyze those second and third order effects that um, I've spoken about, I would say that uh, they are not any further ahead than we are. Uh, nor are they noticeably further behind. Uh, we're, we're, we're all struggling with this. We're, we're, we're all trying to map out the future. And like I said, none of us have a crystal ball. Um, they have woken up to the Arctic issues in, the, in about the last 12 months, I think it's fair to say. And uh, I don't know will that, what that will do in the coming years, but uh, we certainly are not behind our major ally, the United States. We know that China has expressed very serious interest in, uh, in the Arctic. I think it is predominantly because of the resources that exist there, even things as simple as fresh water. Uh, so we'll have to see how that unfolds. Uh, but clearly, with our major U.S. ally, um, we, we stand up quite well. Yeah, I, I would offer that in many ways, the way that we orchestrate the actions of all members of the federal family with uh, a mandate uh, in protection of our ocean approaches that Canada is looked to by many other states as a model of how you bring together in an integrated manner a set of effects that involves a whole bunch of people uh, for which we, uh, we support. The, we have, in fact, we are world leaders in this uh, area that I mentioned earlier this evening called Maritime Domain Awareness. We have people coming from all over the world to understand how we, within our regulatory framework, developed a set of relationships and protocols and knitting together our various sensors and systems from the seabed to near space in order to provide to Canada Command the, the domain cognizance so that they can do their job both in planning and execution of operations uh, domestic and continental. We have people coming from all over the world. And in that area, we are at the point. So that's a really good news story. And the, and the government of Canada and its national 
uh, marine uh, er, security policy, assign the lead uh, to that, to the Canadian forces, and the Navy was privileged to, uh, to take that on. We're really proud of that result, and so should every Canadian. It's a great news story. It's typical for how we are given a complex problem, and we roll up our sleeves with the other members of the federal family and get it done. So my, my two cents on this, I guess, dealing with it in sequ uh, sequential order. The United States, I agree very much with the comments, the United States identified the Arctic as a priority, but not nearly as high a priority as we have. Yes, a U.S. presidential directive came out in the last days of the Bush administration. Yes, Task Force Climate Change has identified this as a priority. Yes, the U.S. Navy has an Arctic roadmap. In terms of investment in hard resources, the Americans are far behind. They can't even get the funding to build a replacement icebreaker for their Coast Guard fleet, which is as old as ours. So we often look to the Americans and think that they're this endless source of money if you deal with anything relating to security. They're finding it tough, and certainly I'm down in Washington this fall on a Fulbright, and it's interesting because the people I'm speaking with are actually keen at looking for abilities to partner and leverage, say, infrastructure that we're building in the Eastern Arctic for example, if they're building stuff in the Western Arctic. So they're seeing the possibility for agreeing to disagree on the Northwest Passage issue because we have for a long time and it's worked, and they don't see any reason why we can't, while at the same time getting down to business and working together. In terms of the Russians, I think we need to have a major shift in this country to recognize we have a lot to learn from the Russians. They're managing a northern sea route. They've had a debate that we have not had in this country. We're so busy fixated on the potential sovereignty loss of the Northwest Passage. We have not had the debate on whether we want the Northwest Passage to be used as a viable shipping route. And if we want it to be used, then we need to start investing in infrastructure now, and that includes figuring out bathymetry, figuring out what are the safe routes, building the aids to navigation that are necessary, and thinking about port facilities, which are gonna be long-term investments. Or we need to decide we don't want it to be used for international, uh, for international transit passage, and therefore start investing like crazy in the Navy and subsurface sonar and satellite assets, because we're gonna be very, very busy keeping out any shipping in the name of protecting our Arctic waters. Somewhere down the road, yet to be determined. We have a lot to learn from the Russians in my mind because they're already figuring out how to do this. They're pushing the boundaries of international law. They're quite provocative. Sit down and watch and wait because we're not in a great big rush. Third, the Chinese. I was in Russia in February with a group of international lawyers talking with the Chinese about Arctic issues. Fascinating. Rob Hubert was there trying to get them to commit to saying that there was a security threat and they're building infrastructure and naval capacity to be able to go and take away resources. Quite the opposite. Their retired admiral, their great grand strategic luminary said, we're interested in resources, we're interested in climate change. We don't know much about the region yet. Chinese are patient. They're not interested in coming up here and fighting over resources. They've said, and we've seen the signals, they'll buy the companies, like they're buying the oil patch. And if they want access to those resources, it's the investment front. But they are interested in science, and they're very interested in partnerships. So I don't want to say that there's not potential subtext in the messaging that they're sending. But it was very clear to all of us who were there, I think, the Chinese are not looking to create some sort of war over resources in the Arctic. There are easier, much, much easier ways for that, them to get them. Now that's passion. People question, how do Aboriginal voices, concerns and interests factor into this discussion of the North from a military perspective? This question was, was directed to Brigadier Colin and, and Captain Beltran. Yeah, I mean, I think I touched, about, touched on it a little bit when I talked about second and third order effects. Um, we need to be very careful moving forward that we actually clearly understand um, the communities in which we will operate in the north. And we're not there yet. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done in that regard. We will, we do, take advantage of the Canadian Rangers in that regard. They are, for the most part, from the local communities, with very, very few exceptions. Um, they have already established a relationship with the military, and they clearly have an, uh, an established relationship with their community. So they're almost, if you will, a bit of a conduit. Uh, for us into those communities. And we do leverage that at every opportunity. Um, a lot of the rangers are also the community leaders in addition to being rangers. So that also assists in us better understanding the communities and working with them. I, I would like to say that we have a fairly mature approach and understand the importance of that. 
whether or not we are as good as we ought to be, clearly I would say we still have work to do. Uh, but at least we recognize that and are working towards it. What I would add to that is the challenge of the mariner operating in that environment. And for uh, the Navy, we will be learning very closely from the Coast Guard. Coast Guard are first-class mariners. Anyone here from the Coast Guard uh, or who has worked with them will know that they understand the sea as deeply as anyone on Earth. And moreover, they understand our northern waters and working in Arctic ice better than anybody else in the world. So when it comes to learning about that environment, we will be taking a lesson from our Coast Guard, many of whom have spent entire careers working, serving in, uh, communities and building, uh, building our north. I'm going to ask a couple of more questions in the interest of time. I have quite a pile here. Um, but this one is, again, for the three of you to uh, um, take a discussion on. The CIC GPS report suggests that the Coast Guard could be more effective in the Arctic sovereignty saga by coming under D&D or public safety, not fisheries and oceans. Do you agree? Yeah. Um, I think we'll let Whitney comment on this one. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a strong, I'm not a fan at all. I think um, the Coast Guard has evolved with a very different culture than the Canadian Navy. I think, again, kudos to the Harper government for making a, a commitment in their election platform in 2005 saying they were going to build icebreaker capabilities for the Canadian Navy. And when the Navy said, no, that capability properly belongs with this civilian agency, the government listened and investing in the Coast Guard, which faces its issues. It has been very poor in terms of coming up with a strategic plan. It faces real trouble with recruitment, retention, and specialized trades. The reality is it's still doing its job better than anybody else could. To try and bring it into the Canadian Navy is a real problem. How do you deal with very different cultures in terms of posting to be an, an ice master, a specialist? You've got to spend your entire career focused on that particular skill it means you're gonna run into an ice ceiling or a glass ceiling very, very quickly within the Canadian Navy. So I'm a very strong proponent of saying the Canadian Coast Guard, the icebreakers are platforms. You can do a lot of things with these icebreakers. If you need to bring a gun on board for some reason because the RCMP had to go and enforce regulations, you can do so. But having them permanently armed, once again, you're adding to the number of hats that you're asking the Coast Guard to go and wear at a given time. Most of their operations are absolutely routine and they are exercising, demonstrating Canadian sovereignty, taking scientific crews out there. They don't demonstrate or bolster Canadian sovereignty by having a gun on the front of them. I suppose the only thing I would add is, what exactly is it in the Canadian Coast Guard that is the problem you're trying to fix? And would putting it under the Canadian Navy actually solve that problem if you were to identify it? So, I mean, rolling other organizations under the Canadian forces is not the be-all, end-all. Uh, so I think that question needs to be asked and answered as well. You know, what is it exactly that you're trying to fix in the Coast Guard, and would it be fixed if it was under the Canadian Navy? This is a question that has come up many times since uh, the government announced plans to both reinvest in the Coast Guard uh, with the new icebreaker as well as in the Navy uh, uh, to support operations in the north with an Arctic officer patrol ship. The, the relationship the, at the operational tactical level between the Coast Guard and the Navy in the high north. And nothing that is being proposed as Canada makes that important strategic decision to be an Arctic player. Nothing in any of that suggests that the foundation, the framework of interdepartmental relationships, that basic uh, responsibilities for enforcement, nothing of that is going to change with latitude. And recall what I said, what we do in the Pacific and Atlantic is viewed everywhere around the world with admiration. We've got a winning model. The key is, how do we take that winning model and transplant it thousands of kilometers to the north? Because things that work well, 200 kilometers 
to the west of Victoria, or 150 miles southeast of Halifax, are not going to work well in the north. The protocols and how we operate uh, with one another will change significantly. But the basic fundamental obligations that we have as an arm of government will not change vis-a-vis -vis those of the Canadian Coast Guard. And one of the reasons that we are doing these exercises and operations that are conducted by Canada Command is try to figure out how we change the protocols to be as effective in that most difficult environment, as close to operating on the dark side of the moon as you can get anywhere on the face of this planet. That's why we're up there, is to try to figure out how to do what we already know how to do well south. Any final remarks, General Collin? Um, well, first of all, I'll mention that I plan on, on sticking around for a while uh, after we close out this evening. And certainly the emphasis tonight, rightfully so, has been on the north. Um, if there are other questions that interest you about the Canadian Forces that you haven't had an opportunity to ask, either on the North or on other issues, I'm uh, more than happy to be approached after this plenary session uh, and answer as best as I can. On the subject at hand, uh, I think I would simply mention that there's still a lot of thought that needs to go on into exactly how the government will exercise sovereignty in the North. And I mean sovereignty by the definition I exposed at the beginning, not just security, but socioeconomic, geopolitical, rule of law, etc. We, um, we, ha we have a lot still to learn, back to we don't know what we don't know yet. But I think it's fair to say that almost without exception, or perhaps without exception, all federal government departments are now starting to place more and more emphasis on the North and the Arctic. Because our government has told us to do so, but also because we recognize the issues that are at play there. So I think over the next few years, you're going to see continued evolution, not revolution, but evolution in what we do in the North. I would strongly try to dissuade individuals who want to take this to the revolutionary platform. I've heard a lot of comments recently about how we need all sorts of new and different governance structures, that we need different regulatory procedures, that we need different relationships between the various federal government departments, different statutes, different responsibilities. I don't buy off on any of that, actually. I believe that our current constructs, our current structures, our current mandates will serve us equally well in Canada's north. It's just a question of putting a bit, a bit of emphasis on it to figure out the issues that are associated with it. So I don't think we're into revolution. I don't think we're into panic mode. I don't think there's a sense of urgency that would require us to run around with our hair on fire. But I do think we need to spend some time thinking through the issues and mapping out the way ahead. And that's exactly what we're doing now. Captain Any anything from you, final remarks? Yeah. When I was 17 years old, I went to the North for the first time. I was a Hastings and Prince Edward A Company man at the time. And we uh, deployed for about a month period on an exercise called uh, New Viking. And I wasn't ready for that experience, having lived in the South for my young life. And I was just, for me, it was a transformational experience. I can recall carrying the radio for the company commander, and we were stopped on a ridge uh, at a, a height of about 1,500 feet, and we could see a set of mountains in the distance. And we wanted to know how far away they were. And so I folded the, unfolded uh, the, the map, and we couldn't see them. We thought they were about 10, 12, maybe 15 kilometers away. And we kept unfolding the map, and it turned out that what we were looking at was 80 kilometers away, but the air so pristine, so clear of pollution, that they looked just a fraction of that distance. Later that day, 
the company stopped and drank the waters from a, the bottom of a glacier. Waters that had been in solid form perhaps for millennia and that we were drinking for the first time. Water from the time of Christ. You know, when we sing the national anthem, True North Strong and Free, that resonates for all of us in the same way that when Americans sing the rocket's red glare. The Arctic occupies a strong place in all our hearts. As General Collins said, it now must occupy equally a strong place in our minds and indeed in our pocketbooks as we become an Arctic state. Thank you. And Dr. Lackenbauer. Great, well thanks. First of all, I'd just like to thank our transformers and commanders who've been here and I think really contributed a lot to my own knowledge of a lot of these issues, particularly from your practitioner's standpoints. I mean, I'm caught up constantly in academic discussions and media conversations on these issues, but I'm very reassured by the spirit that General Colin articulated here at the end, the need for a dialogue and the fact that there are questions, and rather than giving us the suggestion, this aura that all the answers are in hand, it's an ongoing journey, and now that I think as a nation we're perhaps moving beyond the notion that this is an urgent crisis circa 2007, the Russians planting their flags at the North Pole, we realize we have time to get things right, and it means coming up with concepts like the Arctic Response Company groups, testing them out, getting to initial operating capability, and realizing there's time to go and rejig things if need be, work out ways for the Navy, the Air Force, the, the land forces to work together. So again, I hear this message of patience. And, I was fortunate, I was embedded with two platoon of the Arctic Response Company group out of Ontario in Operation Nanook in August. And we were up in, in Resolute and then sent down to Pond Inlet, interesting cooperation. We went down on a naval vessel, so they weren't planning on taking over Hans Island that day. In fact, they were cooperating, interoperating together. Went to Pond Inlet, then we went across and did amphibious landings on, on Bylet Island. Beautiful place, bird sanctuary, simply incredible about 80 kilometers out of the community. And I was there, and one of the rangers, Paul Adaguta, took me up, and, and we broke away from the main group and went walking. We were walking through, and you've seen some of the pictures. They looked like lush Irish meadows that we were walking through, as opposed to my preconceived southern notions of what the Arctic is. And we walked around, and you hear how fast I talk and how high energy I am. Everything calms down. There's a pace to the north. There's a sense of reflection that's amazing. And he was sharing his concerns and thoughts on the north as someone who'd lived there. After a while, we, we just stopped talking. Probably can't believe that, but I actually do stop talking once in a while. And uh, went there and we sat down and he let up a cigarette and was literally just lying on this, this bank of grass. And nothing was exchanged for about five minutes. And then he said, I'm home. And it's strange, I've been up dozens and dozens of times to the Arctic, not just to the Arctic, but traveling in the Arctic. And it hit my soul, like right to the core, hit me. You know, here I am, I'm traversing these landscapes. I go, I visit them. I'm passing through. He is here. This is foreign to me. To him, this is familiar. This was the stretch of land he'd grown up on. So when I think about sovereignty and security issues, I think about their importance. Really what comes to my mind is Paul and thinking, he is using it. There's no way Paul Ataguta is going to lose it. And as a country, we have a lot to learn from one another. And we're very fortunate that the Canadian forces have that incredible established relationship in the north with northern communities through the Canadian Rangers, footprints throughout the north that aren't stepping on anybody. But in fact, there's a lot of cooperation. And in that sense, I think we do serve, as the captain is saying, Captain Bertrand is saying, as a model for the world. Thank you, gentlemen, for this truly dynamic and engaging discussion. I'd like to now call upon Dr. Alistair Edgar, the um, Executive Director of AQUINS, the Academic Council on the United Nations System, to come up and thank you on behalf of CIC, CG, ICE Leadership, and everybody here this evening. Hi. I don't need to list all of the organizations because they've been mentioned several times. Um, but I do want to say, uh, I'm a professor at Wilfrid Laurier University with a, a research connection here at CG. Um, very pleased to be a member of the Canadian International Council. Um, this has been a really interesting evening for me. Uh, I've come from sitting behind a desk, um, raising funds and organizing conferences to get out in the evening and listen to a really excellent conversation this evening. 
Uh, it's nice to come to an event which isn't also prepared papers. It's a real conversation uh, between uh, experts, practitioners, and academics. Uh, it's a great mix. I'm very happy that this, this kind of conversation is taking place. Um, I'm very pleased to see uh, how many people have come out um, to listen to the talk today. So uh, on behalf of Canadian International Council, um, I want to thank CG for giving us the facilities. I want to thank our speakers, our participants today, uh, Brigadier General Colin, um, Captain Bertrand, Whitney Lackenbauer, and I'd like to call uh, Joan to come up and make a presentation to our speakers. Thank you. And that concludes the evening. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you really enjoyed probably the first kickoff event of Commanders and Transformers. There are definitely going to be more. Thank you very much.